if we start now. Um, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to introduce um, Dr. Anaren uh, Ellis Evans from Oxford, who um, is a young scholar that has an impressive number of credentials already. Um, he studied ancient and modern um, history at Balliol College in Oxford. And he um, followed it up with an MPhil and then a, a DPhil, a PhD. And his subject was um, basically looking at the Troas, um, the island of Lesbos in particular, in the um, geographical context um, in Western Turkey. He, um, since 2013, has been a junior research fellow at Queen's College in Oxford. And he's working, um, we hope to have his thesis done quite soon as a monograph, which is an achievement in itself, getting it published. Um, his other interests are very widespread. In fact, he just participated at Columbia um, in a symposium organized by himself and John Ma, I suppose, um, on Hellenistic poetry and in a more wider context, a very interesting um, subject that is, is uh, which he's also an expert. And of course, one of his um, seems real loves seem to be um, numismatics um, in, in a wider context. So, so an incredibly widespread um, area of interest. And um, Today, um, he is going to speak about um, his wonderfully long title, um, Imperialism and Regionalism in the Athenian Empire, an Attic Way Coinage from Northwest Turkey and its Afterlife, which is um, something that I have heard a fair amount about because uh, Jonathan King, my husband, and he is sort of part of this, is a team, so to speak, but um, and I, I believe is going to deliver this. So. Um, I look very much forward to hearing it from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for that, Uta. And, um, and uh, I'd just like to thank the ANS for the uh, invitation to speak. Um, and it's really nice to give this paper before an audience of numismatists. Um, and secondly, I'd like to um, thank John and Uta for the amazing hospitality that they've extended to me and Lydia during our stay. It's made it really special. Um, so the second thing I should say is, as Uta mentioned, um, this is a collaboration between myself and John, um, and the work is, is as much his as, as mine. Um, just to briefly talk about the handout, um, most of this, most of the uh, long tables are going to appear up on the screen as well. Um, and at the back of the handout, you have, uh, so on page five, you've got a map of the region and all the mints uh, I'll be talking about. And on pages six to nine, you've got a rough and ready indication of what coins um, we are discussing. Um, so if you want to refer back to that and point out where I've gone wrong, then that's, that's the place to do it. Um, right. Um, so Okay, um, and yes, that's what the lovely coins look like. Uh, so, in the 20th century, um, epigraphy transformed the way we viewed the Athenian Empire. However, most of the new epigraphy was from Athens, and most of this Athenian epigraphy described the mechanisms of empire from an Athenian perspective. As a result, we have developed a view of the Athenian Empire, which could be termed the epigrapher's empire. It has a strong sense of where the important decisions are made, Athens, what the important issues are, tribute, law and status, and of the high capacity of Athens to turn its imperial pronouncements into imperial realities. However, this is of course a one-sided perspective on Athenian imperialism, and one which therefore brings with it dangers. As we know from the Hellenistic and Imperial periods, where the epigraphic evidence is rich enough to tell us as much about the perspective of the ruled as that of the rulers, in their correspondence with their subjects, imperial centres often, uh, often represent the world as they would like it to be, rather than as it actually was. As Fergus Miller has shown with the Roman Emperor and John Marr with the Hellenistic kings, while rulers like to represent <coughs> like to represent themselves as proactive decision-makers with an unlimited capacity to tell their subjects what to do, 
In practice, there were always significant limitations on their power, and as a result, their relationship with their subjects was often reactive rather than proactive. We will probably never have enough epigraphic evidence from the cities of the Delian League to allow us to perform this kind of reality check on the Athenian Empire on the basis of the inscriptions alone. However, we can regain some of this regional perspective on the Athenian Empire if we instead make proper use of the numismatic evidence. For much of the 20th century, numismatists working on the Athenian Empire had their agenda set for them by the epigraphers and historians. As a result, their focus was often on trying to find numismatic evidence to prove or disprove hypotheses which, <coughs> which arose from the epigraphic evidence. For example, <coughs> trying to find a mid-century gap in silver production caused by the standards decree, rather than on allowing the coins to tell their own story. The dangers inherent in this approach to the numismatic evidence have recently become apparent with the downdating of the standards decree from the circa 449 to the mid 420s and perhaps as late as 415, 414 according to some. Not only does this suggest that the decree may not have been in effect long enough to make a perceptible impact on the numismatic evidence, therefore invalidating the whole line of inquiry, it also reveals that the chronologies of many coinages which assumed a mid-century gap in production now need to be redone. In recent years, a much more promising approach has been taken by Thomas Figuera and Jack Kroll, among others. As they have shown, the story which the coins want to tell us is twofold. Firstly, Athens used its access to the mines of Laurion to produce silver coinage in truly staggering volumes. This flood of high-quality silver coins meant that by the 460s, Athenian owls were becoming the standard coinage for much of the Aegean basin. Secondly, at precisely this period in the middle quarters of the 5th century, when we see Athenian coin production ramping up, we also see a corresponding decline in the number of cities minting within the Athenian Empire, and, among those mints which stayed open, a further decline in the number of mints producing large denomination coinage. In this way, we see how Athens used the financial resources available to it to reshape the Aegean world. The next step, however, is to move beyond this imperial perspective on coinage and look at local coinages, not just for what their absence can tell us about the impact of Athens on its empire, but also for what their presence can tell us about regional responses to Athenian imperialism. In this paper, uh, I will explore these ideas through um, a case study of 15 mints in northwestern Turkey, which uh, we believe were producing Attic weight coinage, but with local types, from 427, the end of the Mytilenean revolt, down to 405, Lysander's conquests. The phenomenon appears to have begun with Athens and Myt Mytilene following the revolt, so a context best explained in terms of imperialism, but then spread to the mainland mints through the commercial network of which Mytilene was a major part, so a context instead best explained in terms of regionalism. So let's look at identification of the coins. The first criterion we have used to identify these coins is weight standard. This can be identified uh, by looking at the weights of the two heaviest denominations, the drams and hemidrams, um, where the difference with coins minted in equivalent denominations but on the lighter Kean weight standard, which is 15.3 um, grams, um, after 405 is fairly clear. Um, as the slide illustrates, the weights of these co coins conform fairly well to what we would expect from drams and hemidrams minted on the Attic Eubaic standard of 17.2 grams. Equally, it is clear that these coins were being minted slightly light to standard, which likely reflects the fact that these mints wanted to keep the coins circulating locally. The second criterion we have used to uh, identify uh, our coins is the denominational structure being used. While the Attic and Eubaic weight standards had the same total weight, Coins on the Attic standard were denominated as drams, whereas coins on the Eubaic standard were divisions of a stator. Since coins on the Eubaic standard were generally not minted in denominations which overlapped with the weights of <coughs> Attic standard drams and hemidrams, we can be sure that we are dealing specifically with the Attic standard here. The third criterion we have used is the choice of denominations minted. All 15 mints focus on producing drams, hemidrams, obols, and hemiobols. Um, 
and the only exceptions to this being um, Mirina, which produced a tetrobol and a diobol, and Mytilene and Dardanus, which apparently produced Tetata Moria. Um, and that, those exceptions are five coins out of 438. Having identified the 15 participating mints on the grounds of weight standard, denominational structure and denominations minted, further shared characteristics become apparent. All the coins are silver, all are struck slightly like the standard, and all are minted at a dram or below as fractional denominations. In addition to these quite general points, um, uh, 12 of the 15, uh, 15 mints, um, uh, the exceptions are Kebren, Dardanos, and Skepsis on the last page of the handout, produce coins whose obverse and reverse types are composed in similar ways. And this is just four of the mints, but gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. The obverse type is almost always the head of a deity facing right in a plain field. The partial exception to this is um, Assos, where the Dram and Hemidram instead have a um, head of Athena facing left, um, while the Obel and hemi Hemiobels have a griffin facing right, and we're going to come back to that later. The reverse type is always a symbol associated with the city within an incused square, sometimes changing from one denomination to the next. Um, and with the city's ethnic spelled out in bold lettering. When enough of the ethnic survives to reveal dialectal features, the dialect is always iolic. Um, and you see an example of that with uh, the dram of Mytilene, where the genitive plural is uh, with an omicron rather than an omega. While none of these elements is all that unusual on its own, the firm adherence to all of them across uh, 12 mints, almost all of which had no prior history of minting, is, is quite striking. Significantly, the four mints which break from this, Kebren, Dardanus and Skepsis, and to a much lesser extent Assos, had all been, as we shall see later, quite active mints earlier in the 5th century. Given the large number of specimens we have been able to record, 438 coins, um, one might reasonably wonder why this phenomenon was not identified sooner. Two related answers can be given. Firstly, um, as can be seen on this slide, um, the body of evidence has increased enormously in recent years. So 72% of the coins that we're working with have appeared since 1990. This massive influx of new examples has made the weight standard being used much easier to identify um, and made clear the repeated use of the same four dram denominations across all the mints. More generally, it's, it has fundamentally altered our picture of the minting activity of this region in the late 5th century. For example, the involvement of Larissa and Gerges was not known at all, and given the obscurity of these cities, would not have been guessed at. Seeing as the coins of Larissa appeared uh, as recently as 2003 and 2014, we should be open-minded about the possibility of issues from other small cities appearing in the future. Given that 46 of the coins in our catalogue first appeared last year, 11% um, of the total, we should expect our understanding of these attic weight coinages to continue to develop rapidly in the coming years. A second impediment to um, identifying these coinages as being attic weight has been the fact that they are all fractions. As a result, the coins can quite easily be misinterpreted as slightly heavier examples of the lighter Kean standard coins, which, were in, which uh, became popular as a standard in um, following 405 and became prevalent throughout Western Asia Minor in the 4th century. While the difference in weight between Attic and Kean uh, weight drams and hemidrams is usually fairly clear, the same cannot be said of in the case of the much smaller obol and hemiobol denominations. The situation is only further complicated by the presence of damaged and worn coins in our sample. Although mi mints often signal changes in weight standards to the standard to the users of their coins by altering the types, one of course needs to think that there is a change in weight standard to look for in the first place, and then establish which changes in design are diagnostic of a change in weight standard, and which are simply variations over time. Now that we have established on the basis of the drams and hemidrams that there is an attic standard to look for, we can take advantage of the fact that the sample of attic and key and weight coinage has grown dramatically to identify which changes in design are diagnostic of a change in standard. So as an example of how we've done this, um, 
This slide uh, presents a frequency table um, at the bottom of the Attic and Kean weight obols of Antandros. Um, these coins cycle through three designs in this period. Um, so design one is the one that we think is um, Attic weight, and you see the frequency table for the weights on the bottom left-hand corner. Design two, you see you basically have the same <coughs> obverse die, but a, a brand new reverse die. And um, the third one, Design 3 has the same types as Design 1, but in a much more stylistically de developed manner. Um, and you can see, just by comparing it to the hemidram there, which definitely is key in weight, um, that you would expect those to have been minted at the same time. Um, and the frequency, doing the frequency table shows that that seems to be the case. Um, the key and weight coins are consistently 0.1 gram below uh, the attic weight coins, whether well preserved within the medium weight range or worn. Um, this is true for both design two with the different reverse type and design three, which we thought likely to be Kian on, on the basis of style. All but five of the attic weight obols and two of the Kian weight obols have appeared since 1990, illustrating how the greatly expanded data set we are working with has facilitated much more fine grained analysis like this. The difficulty of distinguishing attic from key and weight coinage has also made the dating of these coins problematic, since the picture we have had of developments in style, types and denominations has been incomplete and confusing. As a result, both attic and key and standard coins have been assigned a variety of dates within the very broad date range of 450 to 350. Now that we are better able to distinguish from one another the coins of these two weight standards, we can make use of Andrew Meadows' recent demonstration that the Kean standard only became popular beyond Kears after 405 to date all our attic weight coins before this point. We can further narrow down this date range from 450 to 405 to, 405 to 427 to 405 by looking into the historical circumstances in which Mytilene and its former possessions on the mainland, the so-called Actaean cities, could have produced attic weight coinages. The argument for dating the start of the attic weight coinages to 427 rests on two propositions. Firstly, it is unlikely that Mytilene would have chosen to mint attic weight coins of its own volition before 427. And secondly, it is unlikely that Mytilene would have allowed its former possessions on the mainland, the Actaean cities, to mint their own coinage before Athens made them independent in 427. A brief survey of Mytilene's minting activity in the 5th century illustrates why it is unlikely that the city's attic weight coins predate 427. From the late 520s down to 427, Mytilene was the producer of two alloy coinages. Mytilene produced a large billon coinage, a silver bronze alloy with less than 50% silver, which from circa 500 onwards was minted on the so-called Persic standard of 11.2 grams. In addition to this, um, from the 520s onwards, Mytilene and Fakea jointly produced an electrum coinage, a gold-silver alloy, which cons consisted exclusively of hecti, um, except for a stator, which uh, I have an article in Numismatic Chronicle this year um, uh, trying to explain that. Um, both series were produced in very large volumes. Um, while there is no die study of the billing coinage yet, um, well over a thousand examples are, are known. Um, as for the Electrum, Friedrich Bodenstedt's die study of the whole Mytilenean series, so 520s down to 330s, um, includes 1,899 examples minted from 447 obverse dies. Both the coinages appear to have been profit-making ventures. The point of producing a large bill on coinage was, presumably, to impose its use on, in all transactions within the territory of Mytilene, both on Lesbos and in the Perea. When people exchanged their pure silver coins for Mytilene's bill on, the city would not only have profited from exchange fees, but also have increased its supplies of silver bullion. Um, as for the Electrum, Emily Mackel and Peter van Alphen have made a very persuasive case for this being a commodity coinage uh, which was sold for use in Thrace, the Propontis and the Black Sea, where there was a cultural preference for Electrum over silver. These two coinages show Mytilene to have been one of the most prolific and sophisticated mints in the region in the 5th century. Um, in particular, the city's decision to start minting Electrum coinage at precisely the point in the late 6th century when most mints in Western Asia Minor were abandoning Electrum for silver 
And to produce a bill on coinage in place of a silver coinage until the last quarter of the 5th century are deeply idiosyncratic choices. If the Mytilineans had thought it would be advantageous and profitable to produce a silver coinage, never mind an Attic weight one, they would have done so long before the last quarter of the 5th century. It therefore seems rather unlikely that Mytilene would have taken this step of its own volition, and so we need to identify a moment in the 5th century when circumstances could have compelled the city to do so. The failure of the Mytilinean revolt and the harsh Athenian settlement which followed is the obvious moment to choose, and the fact that the coins were minted on the Attic standard and in the same denominations preferred at Athens also points to Athenian involvement in the decision. Following the end of the Mytilinean revolt, one way Athens punished Mytilene was to strip it of its possessions on the mainland. Since the Archaic period, Mytilene had controlled a variety of enclaves along the coast of Asia Minor, from Ophrenaeon near the um, entrance to the Hellespont, down to Nessus Porto Salini off the coast of northern Iolis. Collectively, the, this non-contiguous set of territories is known to scholarship as Mytilene's Perea, land opposite, but, of, um, but to classical sources by a variety of other names, um, for example, the Mytilenean shore. In summer 47, Athens declared these territories to be independent, and in the tribute assessment decrees of 4254 and 4221, they are assigned to a new tribute district, the Actei Poles. Among our coinages, three of the mints are firmly attested as, as Actaean cities, and Tandros, Larissa, and Nessos Pordo Cellini. So those are the ones which are marked in red rather than pink. The question, therefore, is whether these settlements would have been allowed to mint this coinage before 427, when they were still under Mytilenean control. In the inventory of archaic and classical polis, um, uh, published in 2004, Hansen and Nielsen have provided a very thorough and up-to-date survey of the, on the question of which entities could and could not mint in the archaic and classical periods. They conclude that dependent polis could mint, but that sub-polis entities, for example, deems and so on, could not. While their analysis displays great philological rigour, at no point do they really treat the coins as coins. As a result, there is no discussion of the potential significance of the metal used, the choice of denomination size, the volume of output, or the broader minting context. Um, however, Jack Kroll's recent reappraisal of the bronze coinage of the island of Salamis illustrates why these factors matter. Salamis had an anomalous status within the Athenian polity. Its inhabitants were Athenian citizens and belonged to the Clycenic tribes, just like the inhabitants of mainland deems, but the community was classed as a clerici rather than a deem. Salamis therefore straddles the boundary between being a dependent polis and a sub-polis entity, and so establishing in what circumstances and in what ways it was allowed to mint helps illustrate precisely where this boundary lay. Kroll draws attention to new archaeological evidence which shows that the Salaminians began minting not circa 400-395, as was pre previously thought, um, but rather at some point in the 430s. At this time, the Athenian mint only produced silver coinage, and it would be another three decades before it considered producing the city's first bronze coinage. Kroll therefore explains the willingness of Athenian officials to let Salamis mint on two grounds. As already mentioned, its anomalous political status allowed it a degree of leeway which was unavailable to Attic deems. However, it is just as important to note that the value of these small base metal coins was extremely slight, and that at this time the Athenian mint was not in the business of producing bronze coinage, focusing instead on its vast, large denomination and high-value silver coinage. The Salaminians were therefore in no way competing with the Athenian mint. So, while the community's anomalous state political status allowed it the opportunity to mint at all, the choice of what it could mint was constrained by the priorities of the polis on which it was dependent. The particular circumstances under which Salamis was able to mint do not hold for the Actaean cities. We cannot know with certainty what the legal status of the Actaean cities was before 427, because all the available evidence postdates the Mytilenean revolt. However, in light of the case of Salamis, it seems highly unlikely that Mytilene would have let settlements in the Perea mint silver coinage up to the value of a dram, a coinage orders of magnitude more valuable than the Salaminian bronzes. Moreover, in the decades before 427, Mytilene was producing an extremely large bill on coinage uh, mint, uh, minted from an alloy with less than 50% silver. The limited available fine spot evidence 
indicates that the Bilong coin is circulated not just on Lesbos, but also in the Perea. This suggests that Mytilene imposed its use there, um, and in fact, if the coinage was serving the needs of this much larger region, then that would help explain why Mytilene produced the coinage in such enormous quantities. If the Bilong coinage had had to compete with pure silver coins, such as the Attic weight coinages of Antandros, Larissa, and Nessos Porto Cellini, it would have soon lost out. To argue that the Actaean cities were already minting pre-427 is therefore asking us to believe that Mytilene stood idly by while cities uh, allegedly dependent on it produce coins sure to drive its own silver coinage out of circulation. The case for the Actaean cities producing these coins before 427 is therefore extremely weak. Moreover, as we shall now see, there is further evidence to suggest that even after these cities began to mint, they were, at least to begin with, highly dependent on Mytilene in order to do so. This makes the date at which Mytilene began to mint the Attic weight coinage also the earliest date at which the Actaean cities could have done so. At the time of their liberation, the Actaean cities had no experience of producing coinage. By contrast, Mytilene possessed a very sophisticated mint which regularly produced artistically accomplished dyes. Given the dis this disparity in expertise, we would expect the coins minted by the Actaean cities to be visibly poorer in quality than those of Mytilene. Instead, the coins of all four cities are executed to the same high standards and in the same austere high classical style. This therefore raises the possibility that the coins of all four cities were being minted in just one of these cities. The obvious candidate is Mytilene, and indeed when we compare examples of the Billon and Electrum coinage Mytilene was producing in the 440s and 430s, with examples of the Attic weight silver coinage it produced after 427, um, so that's what the red arrows are doing there, um, it is immediately clear that the same mint was res responsible for all three series. In turn, there are strong similarities between coins engraved at Mytilene and those belonging to the Actaean cities, so those are on the third row. This suggests that the Actaean cities were in some way dependent on Mytilene for the minting of their coins. Either the Actaean cities sent their bullion to Mytilene to be minted, or they were commissioning dyes from the Mytilenean mint, or perhaps the Mytilenean mint was visiting the Actaean cities to provide these services when requested. A final question to consider is why we have Attic weight coinages from only three of the Actaean cities. Even allowing for the fact that establishing a definitive list of Actaean cities is not a straightforward task due to the fragmentary state of the Actaean panels of the tribute assessment decrees, there were certainly more than three of them. Some, for example, Roetion, uh, never minted at any point in their history, and so we would not expect them to mint this silver coinage. However, at least four of the missing, or missing Actaean cities produced bronze coinage in the 4th century, um, and, and one of these, Ophrenaeon, also produced silver coinage. In these cases, we may legitimately wonder why no Attic weight coinages are attested for these cities. Two different answers can be given. The first relates to our evidence. If we take the case of Larissa that I mentioned earlier, the only two examples of its Attic weight coins which are known appeared in 2003 and 2014. It may therefore be that examples from the missing Actaean cities will turn up in time. The second and more speculative answer is that Perhaps not all the Actaean cities were significant enough settlements to need their own coinage, at least in the early days of their independence. The archaeological evidence we have for the Actaean cities, which admittedly is far from ideal in many cases, suggests that many of these settlements which the Athenian Empire labelled polis were in reality little more than glorified scholars in 47, um, or as Thucydides calls them, polis mata. Um, Whereas places such as Antandros were well-established communities with a significant archaeological footprint dating back to the 8th century, um, and that's now very clear from the Turkish excavations at Antandros. This supposition appears to be borne out by the fragmentary tribute assessment decree of 4254. Whereas one city whose name begins with a kappa, perhaps Coloni, um, not yet attested as one of our mints, only paid a tribute of 1,000 drams, whereas others were paying up to five talents. The other 11 um, cities which produced this Attic weight coinage did so under very different circumstances to Mytilene and the Actaean cities. None of them had revolted or been in any way involved in the Mytilenean revolt, so Athens had no particular excuse to meddle in their internal affairs. On the contrary, they were either loyal tribute-paying allies with whom Athens had no quarrel, or, as in the case of Gergus and Pergamon, um, not even members of the Delian League in the first place. 
It is therefore rather hard to imagine a scenario in which Athens could be directly responsible for inducing these cities to mint Attic weight coins. Rather, um, we must instead assume that these cities saw what Mytilene and Actaean cities were doing, and for whatever reason, judged that they would benefit from doing likewise. As a result of the um, fact that these cities get involved with this coinage on their own terms, we also see these mints being more willing to depart from the example set by Mytilene and the Actaean cities, who minted with Mytilenean help. Um, and this, of course, makes things more complicated for us. Six of the mints which produced Attic weight coinage had been active before 427. Assos, Gargara and Lampanea on the southern coast of the Troad, Kebron and Skepsis in the middle Scamander Valley, um, and Dardanus on the Hellespont. The data we have collected so far on their pre-427 output suggests that around the middle of the 5th century, all these mints produced fractional coinages on what we are provisionally calling a reduced Attic standard. Um, in a wide variety of uh, dram denominations. It appears that Assos, Kebron and Skepsis continue to produce some of the smaller denominations and so they may still have been active mints in 427 when the switch happened. The existence of a reduced Attic coinage, if that is indeed what it is, at these six mints earlier in the century raises the possibility that the Attic weight coinage we have been studying from these and nine other mints was in fact a continuation of this pre-existing coinage and an extension of it to new mints. However, this is probably not the case. As we have seen, prior to 427, the coinage of Mytilene looked nothing like what it produced after 427. It minted in different metals, silver instead of um, uh, silver instead of bilon and electrum, on different standards, um, Attic instead of Persic and Phacaean, and in different denominations, drams instead of staters, and with different types. The silver coinage which Mytilene began to mint after 47 differed in several key respects from the reduced Attic coinages which um, had been produced in the Troad earlier in the 5th century. Firstly, the design of the obverse and reverse types was completely different and the quality of dye engraving considerably higher. Secondly, the range of denominations was narrower, just drams, hemidrams, obols and hemiobols, and the weights of the coins consistently fell within a narrower range, suggesting greater standardisation, and were not underweight to the same extent. Um, so this table compares the earlier issues of Assos, Gargara and Lampanea with the post-427 issues produced by these mints. The package of characteristics which distinguishes Mytilene's post-47 silver also characterises the post-47 issues of these mints. In particular, the obverse type of the Gargara obols is very close in style to the obverse of an Electrum Hecate issue minted by Mytilene um, not long before 47. Only in the case of the obols of Assos do we see limited precedent in the, uh, precedence in the earlier coinage for what comes later. The direction of influence is therefore clear. These mints were imitating what Mytilene was doing and not vice versa. The, this conclusion is further supported by the fact that um, mints which had not been involved in, uh, in the earlier reduced Attic coinage, but did produce the post-47 Attic weight coinage, so Gerges and Neandra in the Troad, Myrna, Pitane and Pergamon in the Kaikos Valley, followed the example set by Mytilene and not by that of the earlier mints. Whereas there appears to have been a significant gap between Gargara and Lampanea's mid-century issues and the post-47 issues, so just to remind you what this is, compare 7 and 9 and 8 and 10 there. Um, at Assos, we see a more complex picture in which the obols show stylistic development towards the post-47 Attic weight obols, whereas the other denominations don't. So just to go back again, if you look at the top row, um, one and two. After 47, Assos kept the types it had been using for the obols and extended them to the hemiobols, thus breaking with Mytilene's example by having an animal instead of a deity's head as the obverse type. But then followed Mytilene's lead when coming up with types for the dram and hemidram denominations, which had been abandoned several decades earlier. And as we have seen, it stuck to um, it stuck to the version of reduced Attic which it had been using for the last few decades and which was appreciably lower than the standard Mytilene set. So just to quickly flip back to this. Um, 
here we see um, if you look at ASOS, it's uh, quite considerably lower than, than the others. Um, and the only other two which are look that low are Gargara and Neandro, and we only have one example, so those could be um, just misleading. Um, The mints of Dardanus, Kebron, and Skepsis likewise responded to the appearance of the Attic weight coinages on their own terms. All three mints produced coins on a reduced Attic standard in the mid-5th century. Dardanus, much like Gargara and Lampanea, um, then appears to have stopped minting until restarting after 47, whereas Kebron and Skepsis, much like Assos, continued to mint but reduced their output to the smaller denominations. However, Dardanus, Kebrin, and Skepsis all differ significantly from Assos, since when they began minting the Attic weight coinage after 427, um, they did not adopt obverse and reverse types which were in conformity with the example set by Mytilene, as, by contrast, we see um, Assos doing with its drams and hemidrams, but instead drew on their pre-existing repertoire of types. Um, the choice of how closely to conform to the model Maitlini set may simply have reflected whether a participating mint sought out Maitlini's help in producing these coins or not. Among the 11 mints we have been discussing, five had never minted before, and so were in very, a very similar position to the Actaean cities, who relied on the help of the Maitlinian mint. Small mints which, hadn't, which had not been active for several decades and had no experience of producing high-quality dyes could choose to produce their own um, attic weight coins. Dardanus did, and the results, resulting coins are predictably crude. By contrast, Gargara and Lampanea apparently did not, since the quality of dye engraving is very high, and the obverse type of the Gargara coins in particular bears a strong similarity to other work by the Mytilinean mint. The more experienced mints of Assos, Kebrin, and Skepsis did not need Mytilene's help to produce a selection of new, good quality dyes, although Assos seems nevertheless to have sought out Mytilene's help for its drams and hemidrams. So, what to make of all of this? In order to interpret this coinage, we need to answer two distinct questions. Athens was in a position to impose its will on Mytilene, and also to some extent on the Actaean cities, but not on the other 11 cities, uh, which also minted these Attic weight coins. So with Mytilene and the Actaean cities, it is a question of establishing precisely what role Athens played in the adoption of this coinage, whereas with the other 11 cities, it is a question of why they chose to follow the lead of Mytilene and the Actaean cities, even though they were under no obligation to do so. In other words, the first question is really about imperialism. By what means and for what reasons did Athens use its position of dominance over Mytilene and the Actaean cities to get them to mint these coins? Whereas the second question is really about regionalism. Why did these 11 cities in this particular region adopt this coinage, but not other cities in other regions? The standards decree is usually understood to have entailed the imposition of Attic weights and measures on the Allies. As a result, it is natural to think that the Attic weight coinage of Mytilene and the Actaean cities might be evidence of this decree in action. As discussed in the introduction, epigraphists have recently downdated the decree from circa 449 to circa 425 at the earliest, which would thus make it almost exactly contemporary with the attic weight coinages we have been looking at. In addition, one of the fragments of the decree was found at the sanctuary of Apollo Smynthus in the territory of, the, of an, uh, an Actaean city, Hamaxitos, albeit one for which we do not yet have any examples of attic weight coinage. However, the main problem with making such a connection is that our attic weight coinage is only found in one very geographically confined area, whereas the fragments of the Standards Decree come from every part of the Athenian Empire. It would be rather odd if the Standards Decree had been highly effective in just one area of the Empire, but had made, then made absolutely no impact anywhere else. And so it's perhaps best to see these attic weight coinages um, as being a phenomenon which is quite unrelated to the Standards Decree. Indeed, if Jack Kroll and Lisa Callas are correct to advocate for a uh, late 415-414 date for the Standards Decree, then the possibility is ruled out altogether. A second possibility, which we can also dismiss, is that the coins are being used to pay tribute to Athens, since Thucydides explicitly states that the cities of Lesbos, except for Methymna, did not pay tribute um, because Athens had instead imposed a clerarchy on their territories. 
Even if we try to use this argument just to explain the involvement of the Actaean cities, it still does not work. The tribute amounts recorded for the Actaean cities on the assessment decree of 4254 show one of these cities being assessed for just 1,000 drams, but the rest being assessed for um, amounts equivalent to 9,000 to 30,000 drams. Drams were the largest denomination minted in these Attic weight coinages, but they would have been impractically small for making such payments, and as a result uh, would have needed to be minted in enormous quantities to meet this demand. On the common guesstimate of a single die producing circa 15,000 to 20,000 coins, we would expect to see as many as 20 or more dram dies at each mint. Instead, we see four at Antandros, one at Nessos Pordo Selene, and none for La from Larissa. Since there was an abundant supply of Athenian tetradrams in circulation at this time, it makes rather more sense to assume that these cities paid their tribute with that. Alternatively, one could argue that the two minae, or 200 dram rent, which the Mytilenean farmers had to pay to the Athenian clerics, could conceivably have been paid in drams. However, the size of the coinage again rules this out. Thucydides states that the clerici of Lesbos, which excluded Methymna, was made up of 3,000 cleroi, which, at a rate of two minae, would yield an annual rent of 100 talents. In order to pay this in locally minted drams, the mint of Mytilene would have been going through about 30 dram dies annually, or 660 over the whole period 427 to 405. Instead, we have just two. All these arguments to do with paying tribute or rent to Athens only become less plausible when applied to the denominations below a dram. The question which actually needs asking, therefore, is what prompted Mytilene to produce a fractional coinage at this time? To answer this question, we need to consider the circumstances on Lesbos in the immediate aftermath of the revolt's failure. As has been discussed, before 47, Mytilene was producing a large election coinage for export, and of particular relevance to thinking about the attic weight silver fractions, a sizable bill on coinage for use at Mytilene, and also in the Perea. It seems likely that Athens put a stop to both coinages in 427, given that this is what Athens did to the active mints of Naxos and Thassos after their revolts, and Milos after its conquest. Thucydides states that the Athenian clerics on Lesbos were chosen by lot and then sent to the island, and in Antiphon's speech on the murder of Herodes, which has a dramatic date of circa 420 417, we meet one of these resident clerics in the person of the titular victim. The present, uh, presence of resident clerics on Lesbos will have meant that at least part of the two minae rent they collected from each kleros was being spent in the local economy. If, as would be most convenient for the clerics, and as is implied by Thucydides' use of the term minae without further qualification, the rent was being paid in a large denomination coinage, such as Athenian tetradrams, then, the rent, uh, then this would create demand for a compatible fractional coinage which could be used in day-to-day -day transactions. Before 47, Mytilene's bill on coinage had performed this, uh, this kind of service. However, the Athenian clerics were hardly likely to have put up with using a coinage on a different weight standard, and which would involve them exchanging good Attic silver for severely debased coins, which, moreover, would lose their face value the moment they left Athens. What was needed, therefore, was an Attic weight coinage in familiar Attic denominations. Since Athens found it impractical and unprofitable to produce fractional coinage for markets beyond Attica, it would have made good sense to get the experienced mint of Mytilene to perform this service for them. On the face of it, the case for seeing this coinage as having been imposed on Mytilene by Athens is strong. Athens had probably put an end to the Electrum and Billon coinages <coughs> of Mytilene. It may have imposed the use of Attic weights and measures in the clerici, and at the very least, it had created a population of clerics on Lesbos who would have wanted Attic small change to be made available to them. However, the situation is somewhat more complex than this. The types of Mytilene's coins uh, drew on the visual repertoire of its Billon and Electrum coinages, and the city displayed its ethnic in full and in the local Iolic dialect. These coins were therefore strong assertions of local identity and not exactly what we would expect the Athenian mint to produce. Moreover, we noted earlier that Mytilene minted these coins slightly underweight. Its reasons for doing so were, presumably, to turn a small profit from this coinage and to keep it circulating locally. These two points clearly indicate that Mytilene had some say in how this coinage was produced. It is therefore worth noting how the reduction of this coinage um, suited the interests of both cities for quite different but ultimately complementary reasons. On the one hand, Athenian clerics resident on Lesbos would need to spend some percentage of the rent they received locally and would want fractional coins with which to do that. 
On the other, the Mytilineans and other lesbians paying these rents would want the percentage which was spent locally to be as high as possible, so that the clerics would not become too much of a drain on the local economy. In the case of the Actaean cities, which did not have a cleric imposed on them and therefore cannot be accounted for in these terms, we suspect that since, at least to begin with, their only possibility to mint was with the help of Mytilene, the choice of what weight standards and denominations would be used for the coins was made for them. The next question is why 11 further cities in the Troad and Iolis also decided to produce this Attic weight coinage, despite having had no involvement in the Mytilenean revolt. While, as has been discussed, uh, there was a history of reduced Attic coinages in the Troad in the mid-5th century, familiarity on its own is an insufficient explanation for why a series of cities which had either never minted, not minted for several decades, or are all already minting their own coinage um, on slightly, uh, slightly lower weights, took notice when Mytilene introduced its Attic weight coinage and either began to mint coins which followed Mytilene's example or altered their existing coinage to fit this model more closely. Moreover, while familiarity with reduced Attic coinage may have been a factor in the Troad, it certainly wasn't in Iolus, where Mirren, Epitone and Pergamon nevertheless adopted this coinage. As we have argued, Mytilene's adoption of the um, Attic weight coinage appears to have been the event which precipitated the production of compatible coinages by mints on the mainland. As a result, our suggestion is that the mints which decided to conform to Mytilene's example did so because they were participants in Mytilene's commercial network on the mainland. Three main arguments can be made in favour of this explanation. The first is based on a small hoard of three coins in the collection of the American Numismatic Society. The hoard consists of drams from um, Gerges, Lampanaire and Skepsis in that order on the screen. Um, given that these coins were hoarded together, it seems likely that they were also circulating together, perhaps aided by the fact that they were all on the same weight standard and in the same denominations, and so no exchange fees were being imposed on their use. In this way, moving to the attic weight coinage will have lowered the cost of doing business with Mytilene and other members of its network in the Troad and Iolis. The second point uh, to make is that the participating mints cluster in a geographically confined region bordering Mytilene's former Perea. The northern and southern limits of the region are marked by Dardanus on the Hellespont and by Myrina and Pitane um, at the mouth of the Kaikos River. A short distance beyond these limits, we have mints which we know were active in, at this time, but did not produce these coinages. So in the north, Abydos and Lampsicus, and in the south, Chimae and uh, Phocaea. The cities, therefore, which had probably been doing business with Mytilene and the, and the settlements in, in its Perea pre-427, were also the cities which considered the adoption of the Attic weight coinage to be advantageous. Finally, it may be significant that the two mints within this region, which appear to have made a conspicuous, uh, conscious decision not to become involved in this coinage, um, were Methymna and Tenedos. Methymna minted on the Eubaeic standard in the early 5th century, and from the middle of the uh, 5th century are on the Samian standard. Throughout the 5th century, Tenedos minted on a reduced Attic standard, apparently, it's quite a complicated mint, um, which was uh, appreciably below our Attic weight coinages and also minted in a broader variety of denominations. Um, along with some disgruntled Mycelenaeans, it was Methymna and Tenedos who first informed Athens of Mytilene's plan to revolt. Clearly, these cities were staunch rivals <laughs> of Mytilene, and given their strategic locations, along the route to the Hellespont, one wonders whether the source of this rivalry with Mytilene was in part commercial. So, by way of conclusion, I'd like to make two points. Firstly, um, this, um, this case study illustrates the importance of studying the Athenian Empire from the perspective of its regions. While Athens certainly played a direct role in Mytilene adopting these Attic weight coins, the same cannot really be said for the other 14 mints we have looked at. The widespread adoption of these coins within this region was therefore an unforeseen consequence of the application of Athenian power. These coinages therefore illustrate how the horizontal networks of cities which bound together individual regions were highly adept at adapting um, to the application of top-down power and at turning it aside from its original purpose to suit the needs of the region. Secondly, this case study also illustrates the particularly important role of coins in helping us to reconstruct this regional history of local responses to Athenian imperialism. 
Regrettably, what we, can, what we know about the Troad in the 5th century from inscriptions can be summarised on the back of a postcard with room to spare. <laughs> Even the few documents we have tend to be either Athenian documents set up at Athens, for example the fragments of the tribute assessment decrees, or copies of Athenian documents set up locally, for example the fragment of the standards decree set up in the sanctuary of Apollo Smynthus. Insofar as we have a local perspective at all, we are, we are indebted to Thucydides for it, whose narrative of Athenian imperial, imperialism repeatedly draws us back to the importance of the local perspective. The ever-expanding corpus of fractional coinage coming out of the regions of the Athenian Empire therefore represents a major untapped resource for the study of this period, and is also the body of evidence most likely to challenge and nuance our perceptions, our preconceptions about Athenian imperialism. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's obviously a, a major body of completely new material, and um, maybe I just open it up for discussion if there's someone who wants to ask something immediately, or Jonathan, you want to add something. Um, is there someone that wants to start <coughs> with the question? Peter. Uh, this, this is an enormously rich and complicated paper and, you know, on all sorts of different levels. Um, the, as, as you were going along, there were various things that, that struck me and, and various points that, that I, I wish to bring up that were then forgotten as, as new points you know, were, were <laughs> coming to mind. But one, one of the things that, that you know, strikes me now at the end, you know, in, in the talk of regionalism and power and so forth, is that um, you know, if, if we, we look a little bit earlier to you know, the archaic period or you know, the later portion of the archaic period, I mean, there, there do seem to be various zones um, that, that are already um, in place, you know, based around, for example, the, um, you know, the lesbian villain you know, um, zone, let's yeah. say, as well as this zone in the Troad using, you know, reduced attic, if that's what it is. And then, of course, in um, you know, the Dardanelles, there's possibly another zone using, you know, other coinages and so forth. So, um, you know, you, you mentioned at some point that this idea of imperialism and regionalism, you know, sort of a top-down, you know, imposition, but then also um, sort of a horizontal expansion mm. to commercial mm. networks and so forth. I, um, one of the questions that, that really, s or one of the issues that really strikes me is that um, there were already these zones, you know, essentially yeah. in place, and, you know, with, with middle power, um, you know, extending possibly to, you know, the Piraea and, you know, and, and other areas as well. I mean, what then really changed in terms of the power relationships between these zones, um, you know, after 427 that allowed them essentially to coalesce around... Um, I mean, my, my suspicion is that actually uh, partly what's going on here is um, <laughs> it's mightily trying to find a way to have business as normal. Right. Um, so they no longer have actually own the territory, but they still want the benefit of what those territories were doing for them, which was um, taking resources which, I mean, just to go back to the map, um, so you basically, um, between where kind of Assos, Gargara and Lampanera are in the southern triad, uh, let's find one where I've actually marked this up, here we go. Um, you have a route uh, like straight across Mount Ida into the middle Scamander Valley and then across that massif right up to the Dardanelles. And the way I think of the Perea is that they're basically, Athens is just controlling the, the, the sort of the, the membrane and is benefiting from being able to you know, have those commercial relationships and get, get a hold of those resources and stuff. And the main benefit with having the Pereira is you get to tax people at the same time. Whereas now you can't do that, but you can at least make that trade as kind of uh, preferable towards you as possible by getting everyone to be using the same coins as you and you're reducing uh, exchange costs as, as a result. So, yeah. I mean... Yeah, that also begs the question there of, um, of, of what, you know, even, even though mm. you know, the Middle East did not fare particularly well, you know, obviously with the revolt, um, there still is the question of, of sort of the echo of that power, you know, continuing, yeah. and that, um, you know, that, that might have continued on the reverberations of that, you know, even after the yeah. revolt. But <coughs> you still have to assume, though, that suddenly attic tetradrams have take over whatever locally would have been done by the Billin and the, uh, and the Electrum. 
So, so it, it is, they have lost a lot by having given up mm. those coinages. I mean, I suppose one, one thing you could say which is quite changed is that, um, I mean, uh, the kind of slightly odd response that Kebrin, Skepsis and Dardanos have where they don't fully go along, I think it's quite interesting because you have a situation there where people see the benefit of being involved, but they're definitely not being told how to, how to do it. And I think that maybe that's w what you have a, is maybe a network where it was perhaps much more hierarchical when Maitalini was still in charge and had the Pereira, whereas now you've, it's more of a sort of decentralised network where you've got a variety of different nodes which are running things f to their own benefit. And it just happens to be that collectively they all find it useful to be involved. Um, you know, the, the one thing that's obviously missing in all of this is the hoard evidence. Um, um, yeah, it's not a lot of... And also <laughs> for, you know, attic tetradrams in that area as well, too. I mean, they're sort of making the assumption that, you know, the tetradrams are being used and being recycled back to Athens to pay for, um, you know, tribute and so forth, but there, there just aren't a whole lot of them that are showing up in this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, though, I think that's, that's true in most of, I mean... That's true for... That's true everywhere. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not as if these, these coins are, are coming out. I mean, they seem to be a horde of Neandria yeah. obols, because mm -hmm. uh, we have a big group of them. But uh, away from that, these are surface finds. The coins are very porous. They're coming out one at a time. Um, and so it's not as if they're hordes that should have added coins that don't have added coins. Mm -hmm. And these are fractions, and so you know, it's, it's, uh, these are um, you know, kind of lost examples. I mean, uh, you know, we have that one tiny horde. Um, when you think about the drain of tribute and the value of added tetradrams, I mean, you know, I think you have to have special circumstances to find a hoard, and, and you know, we just don't have any hoards. But if we had one, you know, we, 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 we even, even one hoard. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that. Why have a hoard? I mean, for that period, you have virtually no hoards. I mean, this is one of the big. Yeah. You know, they're in the Near East. There, there are no hordes in the in the Indian Indian Empire. Um, and I mean, the other, the other point is that when when the things have been found in the past, people didn't know what they were looking at. So, for example, with the Neandria thing. I mean, with uh, looking at the fact that one obverse die is massively overrepresented, it looks like we're talking about say sixty or more coins were found and you see when they hit the market and but the thing was when they hit the market in around 2008 2009 no one was looking for this you know now we could ask around and find out well you know what's going on here whereas you know obviously that's that opportunity has been lost so and it could well be that they were in you know maybe that was a lovely mixed horde with lots of examples of different mints altogether but um, we can't possibly know whereas I mean hopefully in future if something like that happens we could but government is a cycle of coinage uh, mm. and it is only in the first tribute list that we find uh, non-Athenian uh, coinage being taken into account. The overwhelming assumption has to be that the, the system worked exclusively on Athenian coins. I mean, mm. if only uh, for efficiency's sake uh, to uh, put the uh, onus of uh, gathering uh, Athenian coinage on the uh, tribute payer rather than only central government having, of Athens having to convert into uh, all sorts of other uh, uh, disparate coinages into, uh, into tetradrachms. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question about the, um, uh, the coinage decline then. I mean, so... Do <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I don't <laughs> because I'm... I'm you know, I'm, I'm still not sure which one of the two new dates to follow. And I'm, you look at this kind of evidence, which we have now in the one area, but the question is, A, perhaps this exists in other areas. Um, there's a lot of fractional coinage coming out of Thrace and Macedonia, which hasn't looked at. But then, you know, wouldn't you argue, perhaps, for the, for the earlier date? Um, I mean, I, I, you know... Good riddance sort of thing. I just, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't, I don't think it. Um, as it, I, we would want to be seeing it in a lot of places, and I think it would be when you know when we went and looked around, we would have found something. Um, and I would just, 
we so so I want to push you on this on a lot of places. So when you think of how many places before the Athenian Empire, um, you know, be becomes bigger mint. In fact, the area where coinage, electrum coinage, silver and billon, I think if you had to place mm. one area where coinage is minted by most places from the really mid, uh, you know, from the very beginning, this is the area you're looking at. This <coughs> is the most monetized mm. area since the early, you know, basically since the beginning of coinage and, you know, with Fokia being right there. So, you know, the it's very hard to understand the coinage decree as a single phenomenon. Because at the moment you have, in places like Abdera and, and Marinia, no evidence of any break whatsoever. So you either have to say it was in four, you know, if you believe it's one thing and you, and you take the language of the, the Aphytus fragment that says no coinage, and you believe that applied everywhere, you'd have to say that the only place it could be is for one year, you know, in 414 or 415. If you believe it, it is telling you to go on to standards, then it's interesting because <coughs> there is no evidence of a, uh, of a mint within the Attic Empire starting coinage under the Attic Empire in any, denomina any, in any weight standard other than uh, uh, this kind of reduced Attic and fractional. And only, only Enos is the only mint, and that begins in 479, right at the beginning, that, strikes, that starts minting large denominational coinage that didn't mint beforehand. So if it's a decree that relates only to people who are starting, you know, you can then put it into the 420s. If, you know, the, the base, you know, the problem with the, an early date and having it to be universal and not, and having it apply to fractions as well, is that there are no Attic fractions found uh, in any of these regions. So you would, if, if, if Athens wanted to replace all of the coinage, how do people com you know, commit commerce without fractions? And there are no Attic fractions really found out of Attica uh, in this period. So that they weren't minting millions of fractions to supply the, uh, the empire with, with small change to be all everybody on Attic coinage. So they clearly never c contemplated eliminating fractional coinage and replacing it. So why they would want to just eliminate fractional coinage period is, is never been explained as, as, as logical. So so it comes down that you cannot, if you, if you believe it's an absolute stop of all coinage, there's no place to put it except for a year and, and then have the very late date. If you believe it applied to different things in different places, you can do a lot of things with it. If you believe it applied to standards but not to coinage, and you can, you can understand fractional coinage. If you believe it applied to staters but not to fractions, you can do a lot with it. And the problem is, is, is that the you know, at the moment, the best reading of the, of the new text, uh, you know, is, is, is that it says no coinage. <laughs> if it does. Yeah. yeah the restoration yeah. says yeah. no coinage, and it is a restoration that has the shape on the stone, which no epigraphist who had looked at the earlier uh, fragments was prepared to posit. So the reason why the particular uh, uh, imitation or restoration uh, has been offered is, is offered now is because no one thought such an, a restoration was feasible because the letter spaces did not exist to allow for that. Uh, so we may or may not believe that restoration. We have to re recognize that that restoration is of an entirely different class of phenomenon than the earlier epigraphy on the subject. Uh, and I, that is a high threshold to get around. Uh, thanks, John. You, you stated for YouTube, hopefully, uh, <laughs> what, I, what I didn't uh, have, what I <laughs> say because YouTube didn't exist when I was working on it. Uh, um, I mean, uh, there's, there's recently yet another paper uh, in Oxford on, on the standard screen. And I emailed John Arthur saying, you know, it's all very nicely done and very interesting, but you know, we really need to have a moratorium on. Who <laughs> <laughs> uh, This was Andrew Meadows and Charles Crowther. It was, you know, very nice job and everything, but you know, really, there are other things to be working on <laughs> here. And there's this, yeah. there's a vast amount of evidence which hasn't even been scratched, and we need to go and figure that out, and then come back to it in 20 years' time when mm. another fragment appears. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you see. <laughs> Your paper was, as you are suggesting now, a brilliant antidote to paradigm paralysis. 
the paradigm paralysis is created by the need to uh, adhere to a particular vision of fifth century epigraphic dating and to fetishize one or more documents so that they become uh, things that we uh, almost uh, totemically have to uh, accept to belong to uh, one faction or not. I very much enjoyed your paper. Uh, it is uh, added a huge amount of data that I did not know and uh, I would love to think about. And what is more, there are phenomena that you have expo exposed here that are, are very significant. Uh, now, uh, the, and the, much of your negative criticism, I think, is spot on. Uh, there's a part of me that is uh, reluctant, and that part of me is not, in fact, the uh, uh, numismatic coin decree part of me. It's the uh, Athenian demography student and the scholar of sorts of Athenian colonization. You staked a bit too much there on the Athenian clerics actually being on Lesbos. And that, that's a drum I've been beating for uh, a number of years since the book in 91, mm -hmm. that the nature of the clerarchy is that the clerics are not in residence. And I attempted to argue, and uh, you may have an argument against this, which I've yet to hear, but uh, it may well be in your work, that uh, the opportunities to find the lesbian clerics in situ uh, just aren't there. Uh, and that the Thucydidean terminology of clerarchy versus apoikia would suggest that, uh, for the most part, in the most times, uh, the clerics were, were, were not in residence. But in any case, we do have to square the clerarchy with the granting of autonomy to Middleini and the removal of clerarchy, mm. which the good data now seems to be during the Ionian War. At least Charles Fournier, I think, argued uh, effectively for that. Uh, so uh, Tom, the uh, demographer of the Athenian Empire, may be uh, at odds with uh, uh, Tom, the student of the monetary affairs of the Athenian Empire, who may be a more of an ally for you, if I, if I may. Uh, uh, but uh, in general, just in thinking through these problems, I think we have to think about economic effects and fiscal effects. Mm. and the degree to which they're interfering or uh, inf reinforcing each other. Uh, and one thing that uh, I would add a footnote to your uh, excellent presentation is to say, is to remind everyone that not only do these cities become tributary for the first time, uh, but they also become tributary at a time when the tribute is increased two and a half to three times. And that increase and the likely effect on the uh, flow of Athenian uh, money through official hands, I think, needs to be considered closely. I'm not sure it's going to uh, uh, mortally wound uh, uh, one or another of your main theses, but I think that it's, for me, something that I, 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 would be mu I would be mulling over. Uh, in general, this whole presentation sits very well within, I think, a uh, recent tendency to start recognizing the Athenian arche as just an overarching hegemony over lots of sub-hegemonies of um, uh, uh, Roberts, no Robertson uh, came up with that term, and it's as good a term as any. Uh, a student of mine named Sean Jensen has been working through this, worked through this in a dissertation that I hope is going to come out soon. But the interplay between the local hegemony and the overarching hegemony is what I think you've shown, uh, thrown a lot of interesting light on, when you show that Mitalini is somehow the dominant player or the directing force or uh, the synthesizing element uh, in the minting of these uh, new uh, sabbatic mints. Uh, I could go on. I could go on about this, but I, I, I'm going to. I'm going to shut up now. Uh, and uh, I mean, and just start saying yeah. that you've given me a great deal. Stay again. You've given me a great Thank deal you. to think about. Um, I mean, one of the great passages to throw in there is actually. I, in the end, I didn't put any specific bits on. Of Antiphon on, but the, there are so many good passages in there for this. But you know, one of the main things is, 
you've got the speaker who's being accused of having mur murdered Herodes the Athenian and his main argument for saying why he definitely didn't do it. And he says, look, if I wanted to off him, I'd have sent him over to the mainland because that's where all the Mytilenean exiles have gone. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's maybe the, the kind of the, the intangible element here is that you've got all of these Athenians who were knee-deep involved in the revolt, who've just gone across to the Troad and are now in all of these places and are probably making up large mm. numbers of the people with <laughs> disposable income in the former Actaean cities. Or so, it, I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to prove on the basis of that speech, but um, it's uh, an interesting throwaway comment. It's that and Inos are the two places where you don't want to be an Athenian. Um. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? No? no? If not, I'd like to thank you very, very much for this very interesting paper, and uh, we're looking greatly forward to the detailed publication. <laughs> 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 <laughs>